Welcome to our office hours virtual presentation of facts versus opinion, uh, navigating today's news sources. My name is Amy Oland. I'm the Assistant Director of Professional and Continuing Education here at Oakland University. And I just wanna go over a, a few quick housekeeping measures uh, before we get started. Um, attendees will remain muted throughout the presentation, but if you have a question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A box at any time, and it will be answered time permitting. Questions can also be submitted anonymously. If you would like to view closed captioning or subtitles, please click the three dots next to more at the bottom of the Zoom window and click show subtitles. This presentation is being recorded and the recording will be sent out to attendees by the end of next week. That being said, I'm gonna kick it over to Dave Dulio, uh, Director of OU Center for Civic Engagement to formally get us started. Thanks, Amy. Uh, thanks everybody for, for being here tonight. It's, uh, it's great to have you. It's great to have our, our guests this evening for Office Hours, Holly and Gary Gilbert. Before I introduce them, uh, let me just say a few words about Office Hours. It has been a, a wonderful partnership between uh, the Office of uh, Con Professional and Continuing Education that uh, where Amy is housed, uh, as well as our alumni association. We started this idea back um, in, the, in the real thick throes of COVID as a way to try and continue to engage with campus, uh, faculty, students, staff, as well as uh, friends in the community to try and, and just keep up that engagement when we couldn't gather together. Uh, and we found that it was uh, really popular. It's great to have so many folks here tonight to talk about this uh, important topic. And uh, without further ado, let's, let's get uh, Holly and Gary Gilbert in here. If, if you are uh, familiar with uh, Oakland University, um, you know the Gilberts. Uh, they uh, they really need no introduction. Uh, they have, not to date them, uh, but uh, they've been around for a long time, and uh, <laughs> they are institutions on our campus. And it's uh, it's terrific uh, to have them with us tonight. The the whole idea behind office hours is to <clears throat> highlight faculty experts that we have on campus, and we've done that in in a number of different uh, uh, ways. Uh, that the, that the series has gone. Uh, and we're delighted that we can, uh, can bring Gary and Holly in to talk about their expertise, uh, journalism, media, uh, and a whole host of things that go along with that. So uh, welcome, Holly and Gary, thank you for being here. Uh, before we get into uh, the, the questions that we have for office hours this evening, uh, two other uh, housekeeping items, uh, Amy mentioned it already, but but uh, audience members, please put your questions in the chat, put them in the uh, uh, Q&A function uh, that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'd also like to recognize a few folks that are in the audience. We're very much appreciative of their uh, attendance this evening. Uh, the first is uh, Oakland University President Ora Peskovitz. We are uh, uh, delighted that she's here to, uh, to, to engage with us this evening. She is a terrific supporter of the work we're doing at the Center for Civic Engagement, and we appreciate that. I see Judge Michael Warren from Oakland County Court is here. Uh, welcome, Judge Warren. Thanks for being here. I saw uh, Senator Rosemary Bayer on the uh, participant list. Thank you, Senator, for being here. Uh, I see my, uh, uh, my guy, Brian Beerley, uh, who is uh, only taking a short break from uh, bird dogging any number of stories that uh, can involve Oakland University. Uh, everybody, welcome. We're glad you're here. Gary and Holly, let's get into it. It's a... Um, it's a tough time for journalism right now. Uh, Gallup tells us that uh, the public's trust and confidence is not quite at an all-time low, but it's low. It's at 36%. Uh, the only other time that uh, we've seen a lower measure of trust and confidence is uh, in 2016. I don't think there's a coincidence with that date, uh, but it, it was 32 at that point. Of course, there's some partisanship that, that is involved here, uh, but the slide in confidence carries over with independent voters as well. Their trust is down to 31%. What's driving this slide in confidence uh, in such a big segment of the public? Thanks, David, uh, for the invitation and to the Center for Civic Engagement for inviting us to participate in this program. For Holly and me, journalism is both our passion and our vocation. As you said, these are certainly challenging times to be talking about and teaching this topic. To be completely honest, when I meet people for the first time and they find out that I teach journalism to college students at Oakland University, uh, I get a few raised eyebrows. 
I, in fact, I met an acquaintance recently, um, a new acquaintance, um, who then asked me a perfect follow-up question. So what's your favorite class to teach? And I said, well, gosh, my favorite course to teach is ethics in the news media. And he looked at me and said, that must be a really short course. <laughs> well, yes, to be completely candid, the public has long been suspicious of the ethical nature, the honesty of journalists. Historically, as you mentioned, um, ratings for honesty and integrity have never been much higher than 50%. Even during the days of the Watergate and the immediate aftermath of Watergate, there were certainly a significant number of supporters of President Nixon who believed that the New York Times and the Washington Post had, were just out to get the president. <laughs> Um, and that you couldn't believe anything that uh, the, the, those news organizations were reporting. Uh, ben Bradley, of the, who was the legendary editor of the Washington Post, uh, was often quoted as saying, these low approval ratings, these low ratings for honesty are directly a result of the fact that we report bad news. We are the deliverers of bad news. Um, tragedies for other people are opportunities for people like us. And that's when we show up with a notepad or a camera. As you mentioned, Dave, today, those trust levels are certainly skewed by uh, partisanship. Um, polling shows that news consumers who identify as Democrats or liberals tend to view the news media as being quite uh, doing a great job and being trustworthy. Uh, members of the audience who identify as being conservatives or Republicans uh, have a far different view. Specifically, there are strong divisions between Republicans and Democrats that persist when it comes to topics like uh, support of the news media's watchdog role, whether we're supposed to be watchdogs, mm -hmm. uh, perceived fairness of political coverage, trust in basic information from both national and local news organizations, and even to the point where the, the ratings of how well the news media are doing in keeping people informed, it's complicated. It's, uh, there's no easy answer here. It certainly didn't start with former President Trump in 2016, but he is a factor in today's trust gap. That's about 70 points between how Democrats view members of the news media and how Republicans uh, view members of the news media. I wanna make one more point uh, on this question. There is one other factor. It's I think an unintended consequence of the kind of watchdog gotcha journalism that is so popular today. Uh, Ellen Hume of Harvard Media Studies has written that coverage of scandals, affairs, uh, character issues, uh, the personal lives of officials feeds the public's cynicism and distrust of political leaders and also of the press. Because it seems like, I'm sure to many people, that the press is all too willing to devour anybody at any time for frivolous infractions as well as serious ones. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of factors um, in that distrust of the news media, distrust of us. <laughs> Do we look like enemies of the people? <laughs> <laughs> Not, no one could accuse morning. you of that. <laughs> Maybe in the morning, yeah. <laughs> I, I wanna add, I'm sorry, can I add one no, more? No, go, go for it, absolutely. I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, one, one thing about, you know, that Trump did, uh, you know, exacerbate this uh, feeling about the news media and, and, you know, like to term, call us the enemy of the people. But ironically, he also uh, gave us a lot of exposure. He gave, you know, new uh, focus on the media. And as a result, uh, a lot of news organizations got, uh, you know, more subscribers, more their mm -hmm. readership skyrocketed uh, because of that. So, so there's that. Yeah. So uh, I want to ask a follow up question because on, on something that was embedded in, in some things Gary was talking about there. But but I also want to go back to your your course on on political uh, on journalism ethics, right? Media ethics. I um, uh, a while ago, uh, I edited a book called Political Ethics, um, Shades of Gray. And and the comment was not that it's a short book. It's well, that's an oxymoron. And. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I get where you're coming from on that. So, but the, the question I want to ask is, is about bias. Um, you know, the, the, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, uh, they lean to the left. I mean, that's, that's 
pretty well accepted these days. Uh, there are other outlets that lean to the right. Uh, there are re some reporters highlight certain stories and not others. They uh, blow some stories out of proportion. They cover up other stories, right? I mean, or they or they they underreport. I cover up is a bad word. We shouldn't we shouldn't say that. That's a little. There's some judgment in there. Um, why is there this bias, right? What what is it? And and I think that, that you know you're talking about the Republican distrust of the press being so high in terms of distrust. And for for years and years and years, decades, right? Republicans have have thought that uh, their side doesn't get a fair shake. And uh, they point to evidence that, uh, you know, most Demo most journalists identify as Democrats. They will, uh, when you can catch them in a, in a brutally honest moment, admit to voting for Democrats. Uh, and I think that that's where a lot of that, that comes from. But the, can you talk, address that, that question of bias for, for a minute? Okay. So first of all, let me say there's bias on both sides. You know, we, we can go into that later, but, but um Content that is provocative, content that has a, a strong emotional response gets clicks and it gets audience. And clicks and audience mean more traffic, more money from advertisers. So a lot of this kind of content, this bias content, especially in this era, uh, is political because you know we're we're so uh, politically divided. So as a news organization responds to what the readers want. Uh, the coverage shifts, feeding that thirst for all things partisan. And so as you consume this, as uh, the audience starts consuming this, you're basically feeding the beast, so to speak. And they, you know, they're giving you what you want. It's supply and demand. Uh, it's a, that's a, a very oversimplified answer to that question. Gary has, he'll elaborate. Uh, David, it's my experience working in newsrooms for more than 40 years that generally speaking, journalists are biased. <laughs> um, we all see stories. Um, we all bring our own personal biases into the way we cover stories. Um, I've made the argument, frankly, that most journalists that I know lean to the left politically. Um, we believe that our reporting, that the stories that we write might change the world. And that tends to be a kind of a democratic point of view. But I would also argue that journalists are biased in front in favor of good news stories, frankly. Um, in 2008, when you, Barack Obama- You don't mean like a good story, a happy story. No, mean, we're, in, we're mm -hmm. biased in favor of thinking something that, that we think will be a powerful story. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, Barack Obama was running to be president of the United States in 2008, I heard from so many sources, you guys are in the tank for Obama. Um, you know what? That's probably true. <laughs> but we had a choice there. As journalists, we were covering the first African-American man to become president of the United States, this well-spoken, charismatic character who had this great storyline behind him, or we were looking at the 44th consecutive white guy to be president of the United States. Uh, Obama was a more interesting story. And that's, I would think, why some of us were uh, biased toward him winning. Um, there's, a, there's a long history of bias in the news media. It's a complicated topic. But. Of course. And, you know, we could go on, we could do a whole uh, semester on on bias in the media and the different kinds right and 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 maybe even the ways to solve that or ways to mitigate that and and i think that would be fascinating i i, I have um i've heard you talk about a uh, a study that was done recently uh, and and i happen to read it independently and and i'm in in total agreement with you uh on the importance of this rand corporation study called truth decay and it and one of the things that they point to is uh, as a problem is uh, this blurring of the line between news and opinion. So, and, and I think that there's there's some aspects of that bias question that come in there, right? Because if, if you're letting your opinion seep into your reporting, that seems to be a problem because what happened to objectivity, right? I, I always, uh, when, when I was, um, a young academic, right? I, I was talking to, to colleagues and, and uh, when we would talk about what we were teaching in Intro to American Government about 
uh, the media in politics, we were we were talking about how reporters are objective, and that's what's taught in journalism school. So you know, unpack that a little bit for us: uh, opinion versus versus news, uh, keeping bias out, objectivity. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on that one? This is such a, such a great topic because I've seen polling that shows that, um, generally speaking, uh, members of the audience who identify as Democrats or as liberals want the news media, want journalists to give them the facts and then help them understand what those facts mean, to interpret those facts. On the other hand, we see polling uh, members of the audience who are conservatives, who are Republicans say, just give me the facts, I'll decide what they mean. So we're in a tricky situation here. Uh, this is certainly, a, um, if we have members of the audience who really don't want us to help them understand what the facts mean, they just say, just give them, just give them the facts and that they'll make that kind of decision. The, the journalists that I know, the students that I work with in my ethics course, I teach them that it is part of our responsibility to help the audience understand not just what's true, but what that means. We are, however, bombarded every day with messages that are a blend of factual reporting and opinion. And, you know, opinion is cheap. Opinion is easy to produce. Investigative reporting is expensive and it's time consuming. Uh, ranting makes great television. <laughs> um, being outrageous and being provocative is one proven method for bringing eyeballs to our TV show or to bringing uh, viewers to our websites, to having people buy our newspapers or listen to our radio shows. And this has always been the case. Uh, in fact, there are a number of news media organizations that measure their very success in the number of page views, the number of clicks, the number of reader comments. We know reader comments are sticky because if people go on and comment, they'll come back later to see whether somebody commented on their comment. Um, fact check, doing fact-based reporting is not nearly as easy as doing opinion. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I think there's some confusion and this is probably the fault of the media outlets, but there are a lot of things that people are watching and reading that they think are, are news and they're not. They're opinion shows, they're talk shows. Uh, network talk shows, uh, opinion pieces on the commentary pages of, you know, news organizations are not supposed to be, they're not news, but, you know, I think, frankly, I, I teach news design, and I really think there's been long been a problem with, with news organizations identifying, you know, this is opinion, this is supposed to be opinion, and it gets lost. So, you know, there's a stark difference between NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt and Cuomo, uh, you know, on, on CNN, Chris Cuomo show, which is opinion. If you look at Fox, you know, you see Sean Hannity, Laura Ingraham on CNN, there's Anderson Cooper, Chris Cuomo, Rachel Maddow on MSNBC. I hear people all the time citing these the things that are said there as new, you know, as fact. And a lot of, not everything, but a lot of what is on these shows, uh, the information is largely assertion. It's largely assertion or opinion. Um, and too many opinion show hosts will tell you something that they and and present it as truth as fact without offering any verification any evidence and it's it's there's just a proliferation of that but again it's because it's consumed you know we consume it i want to say in in defense of how we teach journalism at open university that is our mantra we you know t tell students in our journalism program in our public relations program you know you will you do not we do not uh, practice assertion we practice verification and but uh, uh, consumers uh, support opinion news by consuming it david i wanted to make a point about uh, some of the tv talk shows that holly just mentioned for example anderson cooper i enjoy sitting down with holly and watching uh, after dinner watching anderson cooper on cnn from time to time he started out as a game show host remember he's not a trained journalist 
Well, I would say Anderson Cooper earned his stripes. Uh, Hurricane Katrina back in 2005, Anderson Cooper was there on the ground in New Orleans and helped people understand that things were not going well. The government response to Hurricane Katrina was not going well. So Anderson Cooper has earned uh, some credibility as a journalist. But when we're watching his show, and he has his paid spokespeople for, you know, Senator Rick Santorum on one side and former Governor Jennifer Granholm on the other side, and they start in on their panel discussions. Those panel discussions are not helpful. They don't, they don't listen to each other. They have their points that they're paid to make. I get frustrated. I change the channel. Maybe you should be doing that too. And then I send a tweet to Anderson Cooper saying, when you do that, when you start, when you have your panelists screaming at each other and not listening to each other, I go to another network or I turn the TV off. So far, he's not yet tweeted back at me to say, sorry, Gary, I won't do that anymore. I don't think he's adjusted his content. Either, so. <laughs> yeah, I, it's interesting you bring up Anderson Cooper, right? Because he's somebody who went from, uh, as you say, right, and not a, not a trained journalist, but into the, to the media. There is a term in political science for the phenomenon when uh, elected officials retire and then go to K Street in Washington, D.C. and become lobbyists, right? It, it's called the revolving door between, mm -hmm. between lobbying and government. And I, I wonder if, if, if we're not seeing something similar, uh, although on a much smaller scale, with, uh, with politics and the media, where you see... Uh, either somebody from the press, um, the uh, the former White House press secretary uh, uh, James Carney. I, 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 Carvel? No, not Carvel. No, guy from Time. He was at Time Magazine for a while. I, um, anyway, journalist went to the White House. The, the 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 one everybody knows is George Stephanopoulos, right? Mm -hmm. Worked for the Clinton campaign, and then is is all of a sudden a media darling. Uh, but right. we also see it it you know where. Um, and maybe some of those paid hosts that you're talking about do the same thing. Um, so I, I think it, 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 there is that revolving door. Is that a problem for, for credibility of journalists? Oh, absolutely, David. Um, George Stephanopoulos, when we watch him, we, we, we watch him deliver the news, we know, that his, we know his background. Um, I think you, know, we, you, you raised a question about objectivity. And in many ways, our, the traditional objectivity that Holly and I learned as journalism students and the kind of objectivity that we taught our students is now sort of being replaced by a transparency where it's okay to be uh, to favor one side of an issue or another as long as you're transparent about it. It's okay to let the audience know how you voted so that they can make a decision on what you're saying and they can make some judgment on the credibility. And, but, and I think yes, that's I really- I say that the, 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 uh, the former politicians who have become talk show host or panelist, you need to have that information. A little alarm bell ought to be going off in your head when you're listening to some of the things that they're saying. Are they saying this because they're being, this is their personal point of view? Are they being, uh, have they, are they appearing on this show because they're supposed to be representatives of one idea or the other, one party or the other? And, and I think that that, that, that is a, uh, uh, a really interesting point to make about transparency, right? I mean, I think if, if we were just sitting around having coffee, we would we would say that, boy, there really aren't that many instances where transparency is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But if if journalists are transparent about their uh, about their biases, about what they support or what they believe, um, th does that pose a credibility problem? I think as long as they're is the, it's, it's up to the audience then to make some type of judgment, isn't it? Sure. Uh, Jane Briggs Bunting, you remember Jane Briggs Bunting? I sure do, yeah. Uh, Jane was our mentor and our great friend who unfortunately died earlier this year. Um, but a lot of the work that we do is informed by what we learned from Jane. She was just uh, the, the, the most outstanding journalist with whom I ever worked. And Jane was very clear about this. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have a bumper sticker on your car. You couldn't have a campaign sign in your front yard. Uh, you could make your opinion known, but that would be in the secrecy of the voting booth. Um, there was no other excuse for taking a stance on a political issue 
because your loyalty was to the audience and you were expected to be objective. Again, I think that um, I miss those days, frankly. Um, well, and, and, and that uh, leads into a, a question we got from the audience. My friend Kathy Pfeiffer uh, asked, and your friend Kathy Pfeiffer, I'm sure, uh, asks about, uh, she says, I'm interested in the idea of both sides journalism. Many excellent media critics like Eric Bollert uh, have noted that democracy is undermined by this principle and gives by this principle that gives equal weight to unequal positions. And she's, she would like you to comment. And I guess I'm thinking of an example uh, where is it? Well, I guess just talk about that and, and, I'll, and I'll pull an example maybe as a follow up. Sure. Christiane Amanpour of CNN says we should be truthful, not neutral. And I think that's a really important point. There are stories that can't be balanced. There are stories that if you try to balance them, you're not being fair to the truth. The best example that I would use, Dave, would be, would be climate change. 97%, we're all familiar with this figure, 97% of environmental scientists say that climate change is caused by human beings, that we need to reverse it, or we're all going to have to move and go to another planet. Well, maybe they didn't say that part, but... If you're writing, if, if I'm teaching, if I have a student who's uh, doing a story about climate change and that student comes back and says, well, I have to be balanced, the story has to be balanced, I'd say, nope, that's not your job. Your job is to find the facts. And if those facts lead you to a conclusion, then it's your ethical responsibility to state what that conclusion is. I saw a copy of USA Today recently. Uh, devoted an entire page to climate change. 60% of the page was devoted to the argument that climate change is caused by humans, that we need to reverse the effects of it. 40% of the page was dedicated to the other view. Um, in my mind, according to the science, there is no other view. Well, 3%. 3%. And they're, they're so so let's, let's, take a, um, let, let's take an even, even starker example. I think that that because it, it, it comes with a... Um, uh, with a, a question that might be able to, to pull in that climate change example too, right? But uh, if, if somebody says the, uh, uh, the earth is flat, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and, and there are still some folks out there who think that is true, yeah. right? And some people think chocolate milk comes from cows. And from cows. <laughs> so, right. But I guess my, my question to you is about where's the line? Right. At what point do we draw the line in those stories where um, both side, the, the both sides piece undermines what journalists are trying to do? And, and I and I think it's fair to say, right, that that line is probably going to be different for different people. And and, and I, I, so I wonder what you think about that, too. We talk about evaluating sure. um, might be a good place to talk about. So yeah, well, I, where do you draw the line? How do you, uh, how do you decide, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm just gonna back out and widen the angle here to look at uh, fairness and accuracy. To me, that, that would be my answer. Is the story fair and accurate? Um, and it sounds to me like the story that Gary's talking about on climate change, where 40%, there were 40% of, you know, sources or resources or whatever dedicated to the idea that we did not cause it. Some of the, there must, there's some, I don't know what's going on there, but I would be evaluating who those sources are. Okay. And, um, so, you know, we have people ask, you know, well, how do you know if it's fair and accurate? How do you know how they reported the story and so forth? It seems like a lot of work to evaluate this. I just want to watch, you know, I just want to watch the evening news or watch my show or read my stuff. Well, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work right now. It's not like, you know, when I was a kid, we had Walter Cronkite and, you know, we believed him how easy that this was easy. Now we're just, you know, I, I mean, news and opinion opinion and information is flowing it's you know it's ubiquitous it's it's uh, almost I mean you know it makes us that have anxiety disorders there's so much of it um so but there are some metrics that you can use when you're looking at these kinds of stories just some some metrics as, as you start you know reading stories uh for example I'll give I'll throw out a few of them 
Um, and I can share in this information and, this, and other sources where you can find these sort of formulas for evaluating. Um, it, like who is the source of the information? It, when you're watch, listen, reading a story, watch, listening to a story, can you tell who is the source? Is it apparent that there even is a source or might the person, it might this be the person reporting the news? So there's, we go back to your transparency thing. You know, what would the source know? Who are the sources sources? Uh, does do they have training in a particular area? Uh, do they have a job title that would indicate that they have training? I've seen so many stories where you know people are quoted it's like, "Who is this person anyway? I don't even know who, what this person does." Uh, when did the source get this knowledge? Was it recently? Was I mean, uh, you know, was it so long ago that situations might have changed that are are the science? You know, we know science and knowledge. You know, it evolves over time. And you know, where did this source get this knowledge? Do they have a degree, training, so forth? How do they know it? Can I confirm the source's information? Can I? Oh, this guy said this, or this this person said this. Uh, wow, that sounds interesting. I'm going to go look that up. I'm going to go follow up on that. But I'm a skeptic. So I do that kind of thing all the time. It's one of my hobbies being a skeptic. Um, what is the past reliability? What is the source's motive? Can you tell, is there a motive? Are they pushing something? Is there an agenda or whatever? Um, and finally, here's the biggest one, the easiest one uh, when, you, when you're, you know, looking at this kind of information is, are other news outlets reporting this story? If there's only one news organization reporting a story, that is the biggest red flag, because I can guarantee you that means other, other these are journalists, they can't wait to get this story, they want to report it, but there's something wrong with it. If they aren't reporting it, they're scared of it for some reason, and typically it's because there's a credibility issue. Um, you you tell me. Oh, that, that was a great point. If only one network or only one news source is reporting something, then you should be a little bit skeptical about it. I can give you two great examples: um, Boston Marathon bombing. I remember John King of CNN being on the air, looking at his cell phone and saying, "I have sources who are telling me that the Boston Police Department has two suspects in custody." CNN was the had that story exclusively. And you know why CNN had that story exclusively? Because it was wrong. The most trusted name in news became the most busted name in news. <laughs> Another example would be uh, the, uh, the shooting with Gabrielle Giffords in Arizona. Um, remember NPR, which we would consider to be one of our most trusted news sources, had a report from a reporter on the ground that Gabrielle Giffords had been killed and went with that report other news outlets piled on, citing NPR, not doing their own fact checking, said according to NPR, and then CNN goes on the air and says, we have confirmed that Gabrielle Giffords died in that shooting. Well, we know you need to be so careful. And you would think, my God, we have four, four different news organizations that reported that that's true. And it turned out not to be. Yeah, and, and that is, there's so much in there, right? I, because the the, and, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but but I, I assume that the that part of the the journalist job is well, the, the first part is to be right. But am I correct in saying that the journalist that many journalists also want to be first? Oh, absolutely. So they're right. And and is that is the is the pursuit of the scoop? Does that uh, cause us some problems? Does that it leads to? mistakes like that right that is that that's kind of the uh that's one direction that, that I'd, I'd like to go because it gets us down an, another path i think that's really interesting and and but the other the other side of it is that a lot of this depends on timing right mm -hmm. the timing of things matter whether whether it's uh uh because if if one play if, if one news outlet is or if there's only one place that has it maybe they're just first and if, if you're catching that story but after a day or so then you'd have to judge, okay, nobody else picked up on this and maybe there's a reason why. Um, but the, 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 the and, and also timing matters, right? Because as, as Holly said, things change. Uh, science can change. Uh, understanding of events can change. And, and I think that sometimes there's, there's uh, 
uh, a bit of a, a blinders having blinders on, right? That we don't know the entire context of the story. And, and I, I, that, is, that, is that a problem as well? Sure, absolutely. Most of us are carrying a device around that looks something like this, and we're getting our news delivered to this device. And I'm sitting at a traffic signal and I'm checking my email and I'm getting alerts on my phone. No texting while driving, Gary, no texting while driving. <laughs> It's all right to consume the news while driving, isn't it? Oh, wait. Maybe not. <laughs> but frankly, speed is the enemy of accuracy. We all feel pressured to get that story out first. I'll tell you what, I think we're much more likely to remember who got it wrong than who had it first. Well, and, and the one that sticks in my mind, right, is the, uh, uh, is the 2000 election. And, and how many times... Uh, <laughs> I lost a lot Paul's of my hearing, were, right? I mean, it was uh, to be, fr and, and since then, I think news networks have become much more careful in, uh, in their decisions about when to call a race, right? Yeah. Because th th there can be an embarrassment. Yeah, I was the editor of a daily newspaper in Michigan uh, that election, and we put out a newspaper that morning that said, Bush squeaks in. Uh, hey, we had the news like we were we were four months. We were, <laughs> we, were we, we had it right. It was just we didn't know for three more months that we I got home that night and I saw Holly. and I said, man, we've got it. Bush won. I sat down, turned the TV on and I saw the networks were now starting to back up <laughs> yeah, it was from their project, from their predictions and their projections. And that was uh, that was one of the worst nights of my journalism life because we uh, had that story wrong. There's no excuse when you have something wrong. Well, and, and that brings up another question that, that I have, right? And it's one that, that I think is, um, it, a lot of people have it. And it, it has to do with fake news. Uh, so let's talk about fake news. And, and I think I, I, I'd like you to define that, but I'd also like to ask you specifically if, if, a, if, if a media organization gets something wrong, is that fake news? Yeah, a great question. So fake news, I think, you know, I don't know any journalists or journalism scholars or whatever, that term just, those two words just drive them crazy because it's so, you know, it's so maligned. There's, there's a long, uh, fascinating history of fake, of actual fake and falsified news. But now that term has been uh, expanded and weaponized basically by politicians, mostly politicians, to, to, to be used to discredit media reports that they, they don't like or that they don't agree with. Uh, the other thing that it's used for here, it has been to a degree used here and in other countries to limit free speech mm -hmm. by pronouncing it, by, you know, pronouncing it fake news to delegitimize it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, it's dangerous right now. And it's, that is not the, Gary's, uh, he loves to talk about the original, you know, what original fake and um, falsified news was mm -hmm. about. Sure, in the 1830s, uh, one of the New York newspapers uh, reported and had an exclusive on the existence of man bats on the surface of the moon. And, uh, <laughs> It was not possible for us to publish photos at that time. I say that like I was actually alive. In <laughs> yeah, I haven't been um, here that long. <laughs> but uh, newspapers couldn't publish photographs, but they provided drawings so that the audience would understand what these man bats look like. And yes, there are all there are hundreds, far too many examples of stories that have been fabricated, exaggerated, um, faked. Brian Williams of NBC News got himself into some deep trouble and lost his position as the anchor of the NBC nightly news because he he lied he lied thank you yeah. he enhanced the story and put himself in the story um it, it was a good story mm -hmm. but um, it just wasn't it just wasn't truthful well that's right true. <laughs> big problem and so you know a lot of the uh, you you started the show with a question about trust a lot of the issues that we have with trust are self-inflicted. Every time we get caught plagiarizing, fabricating, embellishing, or simply getting something wrong because we didn't make an extra phone call, 
or we just didn't really understand what was going on. I mean, there's, there's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. Most of our mistakes are uh, an inst instance of misinformation. So, so uh, picking up on that, what, what happens when a, a reporter gets something wrong? And so, so that's what does happen. And then is, is the answer to the question, what should happen any different from the one you'd give to that first question? Lots of examples of reporters getting caught um, um, making a mistake in recent stories, anything from like the Kobe Bryant, uh, the, uh, the tragic death of Kobe Bryant in Los Angeles last year, a uh, reporter for uh, one of the networks incorrectly uh, reported that uh, all four of Kobe Bryant's children were on that helicopter that had crashed. Um, that reporter went on the air, apologized, uh, was suspended by ABC News for, I think, a week. Um, Brian Williams lost his position as the um, anchor of the NBC Nightly News. Now you can find him at 11 o'clock on MSNBC. <laughs> I still think he's a good reporter and a good uh, anchor, but he paid a price for, for, for being wrong about that story. Um, you know, we teach our students when you're wrong, you don't scrub it, particularly you don't just delete it. You correct the mistake, you explain to the audience how that mistake was made, you be transparent about that mistake, don't just hide it, acknowledge what happened, and ask the, tell the audience that you're sorry that you made the mistake. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not fair to hold journalists to a, an unreachable standard of perfection, right? Everybody's going to screw up once in a while. And, and I think that, um, you know, I, I wonder if there's enough uh, mea culpa when it happens. I mean, because because it, not that it's it's scrubbed, but right. It, you tell me, right? Where where was the where were the corrections printed when you were editor of the uh, of that daily newspaper? Right, not on page one. No, right. no, right. we reserved a corner down in right. page two. Yeah. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Sorry, we got right. this wrong here today. Yeah. Um, I think, but I think now, uh, and this is not based on any research. It, it seems to me now that we, maybe it's because we have shorter memories because there's so much going on, but we, you know, we, we have shorter memories. So we are more forgiving of these kinds of mistakes. Like, look, Brian Williams is back, you know, back. Uh, there was a reporter for the New York Times named Rick Bragg. He was fa a fabulous reporter, one of the best storytellers. He, you know, he wrote books and everything. You know, he was fired from the New York Times uh, for, I, th I still think he was a scapegoat for, you know, some things that were going on there. And that was it, you know, he was done. He was yeah. done as a journalist. And now he's, you know, people talk about him. Yeah. I remember when Rick Bragg got fired, you know, uh, so there was no forgiveness, uh, in those years. Uh, and now I think, uh, people get over it or, you know, they forget. And, and so, um, we've got uh, we've got a number of questions from the audience about um, that, that I'm going to try to package into into one, uh, and it actually links to a um, to some uh, some more survey data that I wanted to, to to throw out there. But I have to put my my cheaters on to to see it. Uh, it's an Associated Press uh, poll that found 95% of Americans identified misinformation as a problem when they're trying to access important information, and uh, the, the biggest culprits, says the public, at a, to the tune of about three quarters, are social media users and tech companies. Uh, however, only two in 10 of those Americans said that they are they're very concerned that they have personally spread false information. Mm. So what, what, role, <clears throat> what role is uh, does, does big tech, Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, what what role do those daily use platforms that we rely on for so much these days, what role do they have? Uh, yeah, we were just talking about this, how exciting we are. We, we come home and talk about this stuff, right? <laughs> the Gilberts, come over to the Gilberts and have an exciting time talking about journalism. Uh, this thing just drives me crazy that uh, people talk about the media. When they talk about the media, 
um, and you know, what's the matter with the media? They aren't covering this or look, you know, they're reporting that, you know, all these things were wrong or whatever. A lot of times they're talking about social media. They're talking about Twitter and Facebook. And, you know, I just want to go, that is not the, the news media is not social media, but it's very hard. It's the line is so blurred. It's very hard to uh, get anyone, to, people don't realize that, you know, they just lump them all together. Mm -hmm. So the news media's reputation, I believe, I'm, I'm not trying to make excuses, but I believe the reputation is in part uh, damaged by social media, by what happens on social media. And yes, there are news there are journalists on social media who do stupid things on social media. They, you know, they're great reporters and then they go on social media and just say, you know, do something uh, totally idiotic. Like, I don't know. It's, it's, they just come unglued there or something. And, and is that, is that part of the, sorry to interrupt, is, is that part of the, is that potentially part of the, the blurring of the line between fact and opinion, right? Because as, as an individual who happens to be a reporter, Right. You could go on there and and you could you could tweet about things that you personally think. But then you're trying to tweet out a story that you've written. And I, I have to imagine that that is that the, the the public links those two. Right. And sees them as one in the same. Absolutely. We have this Tower of Babel and people are they don't know what to make sense of. And they're seeing journalists who are supposed to be objective, tweet and promote their own stories. Uh, make mistakes on social media. Uh, you know, we're all, we're guilty of, most news organizations in this country are owned by profit-seeking companies. That is a major ethical problem. Um, we deliberately create controversy. Uh, look at the Facebook papers as an example. We know that Facebook has been deliberately, knowingly dividing us because it's profitable. That's, um, there are news organizations that are aligned with the right or aligned with the left that are deliberately uh, <clears throat> slanting, skewing stories toward their audience because their audience is coming for information that mirrors the point of view that they already have. And, we're, and we're so, hardwired as humans, right? There, there, so there's two diff, two two more kinds of bias, right? There's there's uh, profit bias, which is fed from selection bias, and uh, and then confirmation bias, right? That is everybody likes to hear, uh, as you say, we're hardwired, right? Everybody, mm -hmm. li nobody likes to be challenged. Nobody likes to hear something different from what they think, right? Because then then we start to doubt ourselves, and 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 I think that that is uh, it's a fundamental problem right that that we have to struggle with I, let's go back to that to the to the point about facebook knowingly and willingly doing certain things right because or or promoting or slanting uh one way or the other right i mean one of the things we've also seen recently uh is certain individuals being uh having their accounts suspended or their accounts canceled or taken away and you know it, and and it runs the gamut right from uh former president trump uh to uh something that hits pretty close to home here it, the livingston county commission had their youtube channel uh suspended because of something somebody said during public comment mm -hmm. in one of their meetings right so and, and and I don't want to blow it out of proportion. And and, and some will say that this is this is uh, social media censorship, and maybe it is. But but you know who gets to decide mm -hmm. what misinformation is or disinformation is? The, is it the social media companies? Is it the is it the government? Uh, who who decides that? Uh, maybe it's up to the audience. Frankly, David um, Brooke Gladstone of uh, on the media uh, National Public Radio says. You've heard that old expression, we get the government we deserve. I think we get the media that we deserve. Um, and we should, as members of the audience, demand a, a, a news media. We should demand that journalists give us a fair, accurate report of what's happening in political affairs. And as members of the audience, we need to be willing to pay for that. Um, 
I, I was going to go back to social media, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. The audience, um, well, you don't, don't well, get so, me started so on. So, so that's the so so that that gets us into into a a, a, a pretty modern phenomenon, right? The idea of uh, uh, news stories, whether it's the, the Detroit News or the Detroit Free Press or uh, the New York Times or Washington Post or whatever it is, uh, some of their uh, content be, being behind a paywall mm -hmm. rather than just out there for public consumption, right? So, so Gary, I take it you would argue that we need to pony up for that so that, so that those organizations can do, do good work. We've had this 20 year experiment of giving news away online. It doesn't work that way. I'm worried about our students who graduate from our journalism program. How are they going to get jobs where they'll be able to make a decent living? Um, unless people are willing to spend the, what, a cup of coffee uh, from Starbucks, a cup of bitter coffee from Starbucks is 350. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, wouldn't people be willing to spend 350 a week for access to quality proprietary news from a local mm -hmm. news organization? Um, Holly and I were telling our students all the time, after you graduate and you're starting to make a little bit, bit of money, you should be willing to pay for access to news. Otherwise, yeah. how are people going to make a living? Yeah. Uh, because of the business that we're in, because of the, our belief in journalism, we make contributions to uh, Bridge Michigan, BridgeMI.com, which I think is the best newspaper in Michigan although it's not really a newspaper, but it's a nonprofit that is the best source for information about public affairs in the state of Michigan. We make contributions- After the Oakland Post, of course, oh. but yeah, sorry. <laughs> we make contributions to The Guardian, to National Public Radio. We subscribe to The New York Times and to The Washington Post because we have graduates who are working there. Um, Sal Juan Georges um, just won a Pulitzer Prize at The Washington Post. He graduated from Oakland University in 2016. He's now at The Washington Post a member of their climate change reporting team, and they won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. That's pretty cool. I mean, yeah. he was the photo editor of the Oakland Post just six years ago. Um, so we support those news organizations because we have students who work there. But I really think that it's an important point. If you want quality news. Yeah, so there's a I want to come back to your to the, some points about social media, especially Facebook and Twitter. Um, I think part of the problem that that they've become is, um, you know, it's out of control. Honestly, I think it's just out of control, and we're stuck. We have to, you know, we're we're. I was saying the other day, well, we should get off of Facebook. I just am not. I, I'm not comfortable with, you know, what they do and and the rules. But it's so hard. I mean, I communicate with people. Our our uh, journalism, uh, you know, communication journalism and PR. We have a website there. We communicate. I mean, we have a a page there that we communicate with students, you know, it's very hard to get out of that. And part of it is, you know, people, everyone thinks it's free. Well, it's free. It's a free way to communicate. And so all this free stuff has a price. It all has a price. Look what's happening on Twitter where yes, they make rules. They can cut you off. Uh, the same with YouTube at where Facebook is kind of the opposite. They're, they're exacerbating you know, they, uh, and, and seemingly proliferating, uh, you know, generating misinformation, disinformation, applauding it almost, it, it seems like. Um, and part of the problem is that people don't want to pay for news. There is a there is a survey, Pew Research, which is an excellent, re I, to anyone who's watching, go to Pew Research and look at some of the research there on everything. They, they do all kinds of research. Um, they just did only 14% of people pay for, only 14% of people pay for news. Yikes, how do our journalists get paid? You know, only 14% of people who are news consumers. And, and in that same survey, they asked people, how important is community news? And how important is it that you, you feel like journalists are committed to your community? Very important, like 85% are like, yes, that is absolutely necessary, but only 14% will pay for it. So I say, if you went to a restaurant and only paid your bill 14% of the time, you know, <laughs> what kind of food do you think you're gonna get eventually, right? So if you're not gonna pay for good journalism, and for you know media, 
uh, you're going to get what you don't pay for. So we have um, we have just a, f a few minutes left, and I want to squeeze two questions uh, in here real quick. Um, we have a number of folks in the audience asking, including uh, 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 my friend Marty Riesig, who's a poli sci uh, graduate. Marty, um, hey Marty. And uh, uh, Marty and others want to know what are the best news sources out there? What, what are the ones that are non-biased? What are the ones that are that are accurate? Um, and and the ones that are to be trusted the most? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Well, of course, that is uh, subjective, right? Holly sometimes suggests that rather than following a specific news organization, it's wise to follow specific reporters. Um, John Oostin at M Live. I'm sorry, John Oostin at Bridge, Michigan. He was at M Live. Yeah, um, is an excellent source for news about pu pu uh, public affairs in the state of Michigan. Um, Kristen Jordan Seamus, for example, at the Free Press. You know, mm -hmm. she just I don't know when she ever sleeps. She's so prolific. You know, uh, covering did a lot of uh, coverage during uh, COVID. So you know, if you follow reporters, um, an example, another. Um, I'll come back to some sites that I think are pretty centrist, uh, some news organizations that are pretty centrist. But uh, if you're looking for reporters, for example, COVID, you know, what we've been living the past um, going on two years here, you know, it's very divisive, right? Like everything, it's polarized in uh, the coverage. There is a woman named Catherine Wu. She is a science reporter at The Atlantic. Think about alternative news sources, not the legacy platform news sources. Don't, you know, go uh, explore some of these. But The Atlantic does excellent news reporting. Her she her coverage of COVID and related topics. She's uh, science. She, I get chills, like good chills, when I read her uh, one of her blog posts because it's so loaded with sourcing, credible sourcing, and primary sources. But uh, look for sources that don't rely on advertising. If you're looking for, you know, uh, because that's what that's what draw, bring, draws them one way or the other. The Associated Press, Reuters, uh, two news organizations that share stories. Reuters is more uh, has more of a financial bent, I think, than uh, and there's a site called The Conversation, which is a conglomerate of news uh, outlets. Uh, uh, that publish articles written by academics and researchers. And these are not advertising based. Um, and read source, read news that comes from sources that don't reflect your ideology, yeah. you know, look at them. And you, you don't have to, you know, there's these ranking services out there. They rank them moderate left, far left, moderate right, far right. You know, there are you know, the Wall Street Journal, Reason, uh, and Forbes uh, are moderate right, are considered moderate right. Washington Post, New York Times, NPR, moderate left. And, you know, maybe you don't agree with everything there, but they do all do, and they're the, not the only examples, a, a good amount of, you know, solid news reporting. That's really Which interesting. Right? Oh, sorry, Gary. Um, Mitch ahead. McConnell. Mitch McConnell. Um, I don't often agree with Mitch McConnell. But I saw a quote from him the other day who said, try not to fall in love with just one source of news. And if any of you remember the Rabbi Sherwin Wine, uh, Rabbi Sherwin Wine was a controversial uh, intellectual in this community. He used to say, why would I waste my time reading the views of people with whom I already agree? <laughs> Well, he, so, and challenge yourself. Yeah. Reach, so, uh, so if anybody wants to contact us after the show is over, we'd be happy to provide a list of the news organizations and the journalists that we follow. And and that is so. So the, the advice is really burst your own bubble, yeah. get out of your own bubble, and, and challenge find yourself. some things that and and challenge yourself, right? That and 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 I think that you know we we uh, are around a college campus every day, a, a place where that's supposed to happen, where yes. we want to have challenging conversations we want to expose students to different points of view than maybe they've uh that, that then they've come across but i think i'm what i'm hearing is we should all be lifelong learners in that respect and and if 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 you lean to the left right check out the wall street journal even read national review right if if, if you lean to the to the right read the new york times check out what the nation has to say it, it because it will give you a, different and better perspective, right? That I think that's a that's a for sure a good lesson. Last question. We're going to give this one to to our friend Brian Beerley. 
<laughs> Brian wants to know, Brian says, uh, you've got a lot, you have a lot of books there behind you. Which is your favorite? Ryan, you know the answer to that. The Associated Press style <laughs> book. What else? <laughs> it's the Bible here. <laughs> I, I, why am I not surprised at that answer? Why am I not surprised? Uh, we that have a was... copy in every room in the house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we, we are uh, past our time. Um, Holly and Gary Gilbert, thank you very much for being part of this edition of Office Hours. Uh, it was terrific. I, the hour flew by. Um, I am I'm delighted that you could join us and, and I'm grateful that you uh, uh, gave us some time. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, for those in the audience, um, uh, you are going to be getting uh, uh, an email from us, uh, probably from uh, either the Alumni Association or PACE, uh, asking you for some feedback about the Office Hours series. And that's also going to give you an opportunity uh, to give us suggestions for what comes next. Uh, we're going to continue this as, uh, as, as, long as, uh, as long as we get audiences. So <laughs> um, tell us what you want to hear. Tell us what you want to talk about. And we will do our best to uh, uh, to respond to that demand. Uh, Holly and Gary, any parting thoughts uh, before we sign off? No, give it. Uh, are they going to review this? Do they have to review us? Be sure to give us a good review because they'll cut our pay in half if we don't. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's not like a podcast where you get uh, five. It's not like Uber where you get five stars. <laughs> oh, okay. We're not All that right. sophisticated. Just kidding. No, thank. No, I just want to say thank you for. You know, I, I, your center, the Center for uh, Civic Engagement is an amazing resource. And I just want to tell everyone who's ever left in the audience here that the program, you know, it's just, it's great. I'm not saying that about uh, to toot our horn, but, you know, uh, Dave Dulio and everyone who, all the amazing people who work for him, Aaron and uh, Amy and everybody, they do an incredible job of just getting uh, excellent nonpartisan uh, programming and information that is, uh, it's, a, it's a gift to our community. So thank you for thank that. You. Well, thanks for, thank you for the kind words. Uh, folks, if you're, uh, if you're still in the audience, thank you again for being here. And we will look forward to seeing you at the next Office Hours. Have a good evening.